Okay, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is So You've Been Diagnosed with a Brain Injury, What Next? Now, this webinar is sponsored by the Rural Veterans Health Access Program and produced by the Alaska AHEX Area Health Education Centers. All participants will be on mute during the presentation. If you wish to ask a question, you can type it into the chat box at any time, and there will, and there will also be time for questions at the end. Now, if you would like a copy of today's presentation, you can download it from the Handouts tab on the side. You'll also find a handout for veterans that provides them with contacts to access their benefits. Please feel free to share all this information with anyone else who may be interested. Now, we are joined today by Susan Maley, the Program Director for the Rural Veterans Health Access Program, and by Dr. Amy Murphy, Medical Director for Providence Hospital's Brain Injury Services. Now I'd like to turn it over now to Susan Maley. Thank you for joining us. The Rural Veterans Health Access Project is very pleased to present Dr. Amy Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a certified brain injury specialist. And this is a small group nationally, and she's the only certified brain injury specialist in the United in Alaska. And so I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the Rural Veterans Health Access Project. We have seven remote rural sites in southeast Alaska, and the focus is to increase access and quality to health care to both veterans and community members. And that is done through a telehealth network for primary care and behavioral health. And we're sponsoring this webinar because traumatic brain injury is one of the focuses of the Rural Veterans Health Access Project. It's a risk for veterans, and rural veterans have less access to services, and Alaska has a higher rate of TBI than the national average among the general community. So training medical and behavioral practitioners on the diagnosis, assessment, and treatment of TBI enhances the health care for all Alaskans, and that is what Dr. Amy Murphy is going to be sharing with you today, and there was also a presentation earlier today for professionals. Both of those webinars will be up on the Rural Veterans Health Access Project website, and you have the link here. It's going to take about a week for that to happen, but if you have practitioners who you think would benefit from that information, then I wanted you to know it's there. This is my contact information, and we are funded by the Health Resource Service Administration's Office of Rural Health Policy. And I am now going to turn this over to Dr. Amy Murphy. Thanks, Susan. So I'm going to, um, we're going to have the slides up here, but I'm also going to deviate from them quite a bit. And I also wanted to let everyone know if there were any questions that came up during the actual lecture, please feel free to type them in or use the software in order to um, notify that you have a question because I find that it's easier um, if you just ask right when we're talking about that subject and we will have plenty of time for any questions that may come up. The first thing I want, this is a list of just basic objectives. First thing I want to talk about is the definition. What is a traumatic brain injury? What constitutes a brain injury? Because surprisingly enough, um, there are um, misconceptions about what does and does not constitute a traumatic brain injury, especially in the scope of mild traumatic brain injury. Of course, more significant brain injuries are really easily identified, but the mild ones a lot of the times can be overlooked. And so that's why I wanted to talk about the definition as well as just overall assessment, you know, the different tools that we can provide um, to find out, you know, if there is a brain injury that's occurred. And some of the things we look at, some of the things that we are noticing that can come up after a head injury is sustained. Some common issues that we see, um, and more importantly than knowing the issues um, that are there, it's also knowing that there are treatments available for them, which isn't necessarily something that, that a lot of people know about. 
And then we can talk a little bit about referrals and follow-up care. I specifically want to focus on the things that we have here in Alaska so that people are aware of um, basically the network we're trying, you know, that we're working on building in order to make sure that we have all the support services here that are needed to care for brain injury survivors. So the definition of a mild traumatic brain injury, the um, latest definition came out from the World Health Organization in 2004. And this is the working definition for mild traumatic brain injury that is used by this um, specialty and subspecialty um, whenever we're looking at our diagnosis. And basically this is an acute brain injury that results from any type of in energy to the head from an external force. So any type of injury, energy coming into the head can also include, for instance, in a car accident, a quick stop and go motion. So in other words, the head does not need to strike the steering wheel, the back of the um, seat, the windows. The head does not need to strike any physical object in order to, for there to be an external force coming through the brain. The fast mo momentum of the stop and go forces are enough to result in injury. In order to be listed as a mild traumatic brain injury, you have to have one or more of the following. You have to either be confused or disoriented. If there is a loss of consciousness, it would need to be 30 minutes or less. Anything greater than 30 minutes would constitute either a moderate or severe brain injury. Or post-traumatic amnesia, which is basically the inability to keep and record memory, would need to be less than 24 hours. And again, anything greater than 24 hours would be a more moderate or severe injury. And there may or may not be other neurologic signs that are seen immediately after the head injury. So you only need one or more of the following from that criteria and more often than not you can have somebody that has confusion or disorientation that can come in with just that slight period, no loss of consciousness, no other neurologic abnormalities and yes that does constitute a mild traumatic brain injury. I've had quite a few of my patients that have come up to me and have been told that they did not have a brain injury because they did not have a loss of consciousness, and that is not the case based on this definition. Also, number two, a glass calcoma score of 15 is normal. And so you're, the reason that the glass calcoma score is listed from 13 to 15 is anything lower than 13 would again mean that this is a more significant head injury. So what this diagnosis and what this definition is trying to do is basically make sure that people with more significant injuries have the diagnosis that's appropriate. Those with mild would appear normal um, or close to normal after the injury. And any manifestations, for instance, any confusion, disorientation, any amnesia cannot be caused by drugs, alcohol, medications, or any other problems that could be caused by injury. So for instance, if somebody was having a seizure, they would have confusion or disorientation, um, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to determine what is from the, um, what it could be from mild traumatic brain injury versus seizure and so forth. But definitely if you have somebody who has been in any type of an accident that's had the minimum requirements for this definition, they still meet the definition of having a mild traumatic brain injury. And it's very important to make that clear because again, as I said, this is so often overlooked um, not only by providers but also by people themselves because I'm sure if you look at this definition, and you look in your past, there are many people that are listening to this broadcast that have probably at some point sustained a mild traumatic brain injury, which is otherwise known as a concussion. And so for the most part, people heal spontaneously from this. However, if there are continued symptoms, it's good to know what the definition is so that the diagnosis can be made and treatment can be started. And again, the, the assessment piece is very critical because if things are not diagnosed, 
um, then therefore it's not managed well. And a lot of the times, due to a misunderstanding of what a mild traumatic brain injury is, there is a loss of that ability to get involved in early treatment so that if you're not one of the people that spontaneously heal and you continue to have symptoms, you may not necessarily get involved with the treatment that you need. And again, part of this is a lack of education um, of things going out there showing what the definition of mild traumatic brain injury would be, as well as lack of education as far as information given out from the medical community as far as things that you should do to heal after having a head injury. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So a lack of education basically all the way around. And so we're working on consistent screening tools being used throughout the country, but also up here in Alaska as well. And the biggest ones we're focusing on um, for the general population would be the Ohio State University screening tool and the River Mead. Um, we have the SCAT-3, which is used by sports, um, a lot of athletic trainers. The MACE is used by the military. And the Neurobehavioral Symptom Inventory is typically used by behavioral health. But for general primary care and um, emergency room, as well as any schools, um, I am going to be speaking with school nurses about getting to use these um, tools more effectively as well. We do have the tools out there so that people can get the diagnosis. And what this does is it helps to reduce the risk for the development of chronic symptoms or what we call post-concussive syndrome. And if somebody is diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, they can be referred to a service that really treats the problem instead of the symptoms. Whereas previously, if somebody came in and they were having difficulties with feeling fuzzy, feeling cognitively foggy, having a lot of fatigue, they may go through their primary care. However, if they were having difficulties with sleep or difficulties with mood, they may be sent to behavioral health. Neck pain, they may be sent to pain management, but there wasn't anyone looking at the source for all of the symptoms that they were having, and so things were getting lost in the translation. And so again, what we had talked about previously, and these are the things we're working at for the state. And I think it's important for people um, to know not only from a provider standpoint, but also from a patient and a caregiver standpoint so that you know that these tools are out there and that you as well can be advocates for making sure that these are things that are used in your communities. And so assessment when you're going in to see the physician, typically there's a an exam done, um, a neurologic exam, a musculoskeletal exam, they check balance because balance is very important. And you look at any laboratory studies, any studies that may have done been in the ER and any other pertinent notes or information. Now one of the biggest um, issues that we've run into is that people will come in, get basically a very focused neurologic exam. Um, everything typically looks fine on just a basic neurologic exam after a mild traumatic brain injury. And so a lot of people are discharged to home. With more significant head injuries, you will find that there are some differences and changes. And those are typically the ones that are caught and treated more effectively because you're seeing these differences. With the mild traumatic brain injuries, however, there's not adequate education that is going back to the person who has had the head injury or their family. And part of the biggest thing to know is to you know, have those immediate post-head injury instructions on how to rest so that you can heal appropriately. And we do have those, um, and they're either up on the website or they will be up soon for the Alaska Brain Injury Network. Um, we did create a great um, Word document that has all the instructions on what to do after a mild traumatic brain injury so that those are something that can be downloaded even if you don't receive very good instructions from where you are at.
Headaches are a typical common complaint. A lot of people will be seen by their primary care um, provider for headaches. Some people will be passed on to neurology if it is something more significant. But this is the number one complaint after um, a mild traumatic brain injury. You can also see these with more significant head injuries because if there's any blood in the brain, it is very um, irritating to the brain. And so there will be some pretty consistent headache issues. We have some great medications that help treat and prevent headaches from occurring um, with some great evidence behind them. And so th the most important thing to remember from the standpoint of being someone with a head injury, a family member or somebody that works with them, um, is to make sure that someone gets in to be seen for medication to prevent headache rather than being constantly given medications to try to stop a headache after it starts. One of the things that we've noticed is that um, there's a phenomenon called a medication overuse headache. In other words, if you're using things like Excedrin, Tylenol, Advil, Aspirin more than two days per week or eight days per month, then you're at risk for a medication overuse headache and that could be a headache that is even more difficult to treat than the primary headache that occurred after the head injury. And so if you're somebody that, you know, and I, and I will always tell people, I'm like, well, how many bottles of Excedrin do you have? Do you have one in your car, one in your purse, one at work? Um, if, that's the, if, if, if you answer yes to any of those questions, then I am guaranteeing you use too much of it. And so the, those are the things to keep in mind and to make sure that people are aware of. Fatigue. Um, is another great issue and fatigue is not something that you can push through. Fatigue is not simply tiredness. Fatigue is actually a neurologic condition and you'll hear a lot of people that will describe it as hitting the wall. There's a certain place that occurs in the day or occurs with certain activities that you just cannot push through. It can be worsened by insomnia, which is a very common issue after a head injury. However, it can occur independently of that. You can have people that sleep very well at night but still have issues with fatigue throughout the day. And it's important and it's an important concept to understand, especially if you have a family member or a loved one that has fatigue, that this is not something that they, again, are able to push through. Whenever the brain is done, it is done. There is no moving through it physically. There is no moving through it cognitively. There will be nothing that they can do before they rest and basically reset. And so we do have some great treatments for fatigue if that's needed. But I typically tell people immediately after a head injury, if you're having issues with fatigue, it is your ba brain basically saying that you need the rest in order for it to heal. And the biggest issue that comes in is when people are unable to take that rest because of work and other issues where they need to basically be a part of life. And so when that is the case, then there are things that we can do to help that process. Sleep alone can also be a, great, a very large issue and we work quite a bit with sleep and there are some excellent things for sleep management that we can do that are not medication one of the things I like to make people very aware of, um, especially after more significant head injuries, there is a very, very high rate of central sleep apnea that occurs from a head injury. Um, and so a lot of the times if I have people that come into my clinic that have had moderate or severe head injuries, they are automatically sent for sleep studies because we'll find probably in greater than 75% of them they have an, a central sleep apnea that is very important to treat because left untreated it can lead to future medical problems. So if you're somebody that knows or who has had a significant head injury with continued sleep issues and have not had a sleep study, that may be something you want to bring up to your primary provider. Mood is a common issue, again, um, with all levels of brain injury. With mild brain injury, um, we can see a lot of PTSD. I worked in the military um, quite a bit. We had quite a few people that came in with PTSD. And as you can see from this slide, there's a lot of overlap between the symptoms for PTSD and the symptoms for traumatic brain injury. 
The same is true for depression or anxiety. When we get to more significant head injuries, you can even see things that are a little bit more um, severe when it comes to mood disorders like mania. Um, you can have people that can have a new onset um, mood disorder that looks like a bipolar disorder or a worsening of a previous bipolar disorder. There can even be difficulties with agitation and aggression um, after more significant head injuries. And these are all things that can be very well treated but are important to get resolved relatively quickly because it leads to not only better quality of life but also in some cases safety for both the brain injury survivor as well as their family or caregivers. And cognition. Changes in cognition can vary from very mild to fairly significant depending on the level of brain injury. Even with mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, you can have people that have continued mild cognitive symptoms that can last very far out from the original insult, um, especially if it's not treated immediately. You'll have um, complaints of just feeling mentally foggy, difficulty with multitasking, forgetting things, especially if there's a lot of stress going on in the environment, difficulty following complex conversations or if there's more than one person speaking at one time. Um, and this is always worsened by anything that's going on physically. Um, migraine headaches alone can cause cognitive issues. There's um, decreased sleep. Having insomnia for an extended period of time can cause cognitive issues. Or if there are anything, if there's anything um, as far as emotional or any type of mood disorder, depression, anxiety, um, any type of untreated mood disorder can also cause cognitive issues. So it's not something that occurs in a bubble. And so when we have somebody come in and they're having some cognitive complaints, we look at the whole picture. That being said, for more moderate or severe brain injuries, of course, you can have more persistent and more extreme cognitive deficits. And probably um, the largest and the most difficult out of all of those um, when you have someone with a severe brain injury is there's not only a deficit in being able to think and memory, but also there's an impaired sense of being able to understand how much they've been affected by their brain injury. And so you'll have many people that will have more severe brain injuries that think that they are able to do everything that they had done previously, cannot understand why they can't drive, cannot understand why they can't go immediately go back to work, feel that they don't need anything to help them because they're really back at their baseline when they are obviously not. And that is one of the most extreme examples of some of the cognitive issues that can occur after a head injury. And it's one of the more difficult ones because if you have somebody that has a reduced sense of their own deficits, it's very, very difficult to get them to buy into trying to do any types of treatment. The other important thing to realize, we do have treatments to improve cognition. And this is something that is not often utilized because it's pretty, been pretty specific to the brain injury medicine domain, but it's something that I'm really trying to get more awareness out to providers. We have excellent medications that can work. These are not medications for mood. These are not medications for depression. These are medications specifically designed to improve cognitive status after any level of brain injury. And so it's important that to know that these are not things that you just, I've had patients tell me, well, I just told that I have to live with it. Well, there are actually things out there that we can use to help with improvements. Between medication management, between using some, um, we have speech therapy that works with cognitive issues, even some of our um, uh, therapeutic modalities like neurofeedback, these all work to improve cognition after a head injury and can be very, very effective. So there are treatments out there. There are things that can improve both functioning as well as quality of life, and it's important to know that these are available. And then, you know, 
forgetting putting putting emphasis on the head sometimes we forget about the neck which is a very important piece of the puzzle when it comes to management after a head injury and part of the biggest push now for the American Brain Injury Association as well as the International Brain Injury Association is in the understanding that sometimes neck symptoms can actually present themselves similar to mild traumatic brain injury symptoms. So for instance, you can see on the top right picture where there are, um, there are X's along one muscle and you see these red shaded areas throughout the head, those are trigger points. And it's an, um, an excellent illustration of some of the more common trigger points that you can see after these high velocity injuries where the X is where the trigger point is located, the red is the referral pattern, and you can see how some of these referral patterns could be mistaken for headaches, um, cluster headaches, tension type headaches, and so forth that um, people will work on treating, but sometimes it's actually the neck itself that needs to be treated and not the head. And so we work very closely with pain management and with other physicians that know how to look at trigger points, who know how to look if there are any um, changes within the neck. We also work with physical therapy, um, ch chiropractic um, treatments, and so forth as far as reducing any type of um, input that would come from the neck that could create pain in a referred pattern such as you're seeing in the picture. We also know that if there are issues with the neck, it can also create issues with balance. It can create issues with the vision system. And it can even create cognitive changes on its own. So it's important, you know, when you're looking at taking care of someone from a standpoint of a traumatic brain injury, that we're looking at the whole picture. And so if you're someone that's had a head injury in the past and no one's ever really looked at your neck, then that's something to keep in mind because we know that there's quite a bit of feedback between the head and the neck when we're looking at recovery. And again, just mentioning the vestibular system is basically your higher balance system that utilizes, it uses a lot of different inputs. You have inputs coming in from the ear, from the brain. You also have inputs coming in from the neck, um, as well as you know sensation from your feet and so forth. And it comes in also from your eyes because that's telling you where your body is in space. And any change in any one of the systems can create an issue where you feel like your balance is decreased. And so looking at all of those systems together is what is important in order to getting people back into where they can do the activities that they want to do without having a risk for falls. We do have specific physical therapy and occupational therapy that works with these balance centers um, that works with the vision therapy and we're working on training more throughout the state so that there will be available um, resources in your area. And I put this up here um, because you could switch out headache management for any management of any of the things that we've talked about previously. Just to get an understanding that you cannot treat one one symptom, one problem, and a bubble. You have to look at everything that's occurring in the environment. Anything from stress and anxiety, which we know can reduce, um, can increase fatigue levels and reduce ability to um, fully have cognitive, you know, your thinking status, your cognitive status, it can increase fatigue. Time of day, if you're at the time of the day where you're typically hip hitting the wall from fatigue, it can change things. Your routine, how well you sleep. Body tension, if there's a lot of aches and pains. Weather, which can create not only aches and pains in joints, but can also change migraine type headaches. How much, if any, exercise you're getting. And whether or not you're able to tolerate any type of activity le level mood, behavior, diet, emotions, and thoughts, all of these things can, man can alter and change the way that headaches can present themselves, mood, cognition, any given symptom that you would have after a brain injury. So there's no way to treat one thing in a bubble. You have to look at the whole picture. 
And I give this list to my doctors. I'm giving it to everyone that I talk to because the most important thing on here to understand is there are two things that stop a brain from healing after a brain injury. And everyone should know them. One of them is alcohol and one of them is a medication class called benzodiazepines. So these are things like Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, um, and anything within that category of medication. These two things will stop a brain from healing after a brain injury. And I let patients and their families know because uh, more often than not, if you run into a situation where somebody is not aware of that, you can inadvertently get one of those medications or it may be that you just get, didn't get instructions and you didn't know to avoid alcohol until things were healed. Those two things are very, very important to avoid and that's why I always include this slide not only for providers but also for um, my community presentations because it's something that everyone should be aware of and I put out there as much as possible. And as I said before, we're trying to treat sleep without medications. I know a lot of people try to use melatonin, and that's actually been considered safe to use after a brain injury, but it may not necessarily be effective. So before trying anything over the counter for sleep management, you should try to look more for things like environment, changing, um, changing your environment, reducing your noise at night, not going to bed with a TV on in the room at night, um, especially in Alaska, the sunlight can be a big issue. And so making sure that you have sunlight blocking curtains during the summertime and in the wintertime getting as much exposure to light during the times when we have light as possible. Cognitive behavioral therapies work very, very well for sleep too. And so we're trying to work on getting more of those services available in the state. But again, starting things over the counter may not necessarily be very beneficial. So you might want to talk to, if you try all of the other environmental things first and those don't work, then speaking to your primary physician would be your next best set of action. And then mood, same thing. We try to do things like therapy, neurofeedback, which works very well for both mood as well as for improving just thinking function after a head injury. We also work on sleep and pain if anything's needed. And again, that medication class we really want to avoid. So any time that anyone tries to put that medicine out, because sometimes even things like Valium can be used as a muscle relaxant, again, that's a benzodiazepine, so it will decrease healing of the brain after a brain injury. And again, drug use and alcohol use. Those can interfere with medication. We, knew, we know alcohol use decreases the healing of the brain after a brain injury. And any type of drug use can change or affect your ability to think and your ability to function. So again, these are things we try to avoid after a head injury. And when it comes to supplements, I always just let people know I use supplements quite a bit in my own practice, but it's more it's very important to kind of run those by your physician because supplements are kind of like medications and that they can interact with medications you take, they can interact with other supplements that you take. So just taking things over the counter without clearing them first um, is probably not going to be in your best interest. Check in with your doctor first. And then for the next stuff that we talked about earlier, orthopedics and pain management can be very, very beneficial. But I typically start out with physical therapy and occupational therapy because there's a lot they can do. Um, if you have a naturopath or an osteopath or a chiropractor in your area, they can also be of some great benefit. Acupuncture works very well, as well as massage. Um, and there are certain massage therapists that focus their energies on trigger point management and can do an exceptional job. We're trying to get a list of everyone out in the area that does trigger point management and nerve blocks so that we know um, who's available in the area. Of course, we have quite a few here in Anchorage, but we're trying to also find people that are further out and in the villages, and we're building that list and trying to keep that up to date so that we can have it in one place for everyone um, to look at and find. Um, who is either a brain injury survivor or family member. And again, specialized physical therapy and occupational therapy to work with the higher balance centers, the vision therapy, 
We do have some specialized optometrists here in the state that specialize in vision rehabilitation, as well, um, but they typically work with people that have more um, significant vision issues or visual field cuts um, that can occur with more moderate and severe injuries. I also list the medications here simply so that people are aware. Things that keep you from being dizzy, things that keep you from getting kind of that seasick feeling that can sometimes be used after a head injury are not things that should be used long term because long term they actually um, lose their benefit and can be more harmful than helpful. So if you, you know, use the patches, um, the cruise ship patches, with, which are the scopolamine patches, or if you had a doctor that gave you meclizine to help with your vertigo, these are not things that should be used long term. And so sometimes it's better for you to be armed with that knowledge because they may not know. And then again, so I want to talk about some of the things that we're doing right now in Alaska so that you know what we have available and things that we're working on for the future. The first thing is imaging. Um, we do have some, um, we're working on some new protocols for imaging in the state that were not available previously and it'll kind of get Alaska up to speed with the rest of the lower 48. And typically those are involving um, MRIs, MRIs of the brain, which um, can be very beneficial with showing us some of the details that can get missed in the CT studies that are sometimes done in the emergency room. So right now in both Anchorage and Wasilla, we have um, MRI machines set up that are doing some specialized imaging. Um, one is a specialized imaging that is very, very detailed and can pick up very small amounts of blood products that are missed on traditional MRIs. And so we can really find um, things that we would not have been able to find before, especially in some of these more high velocity injuries like car accidents or ATV accidents, snow machine and so forth. The other thing that we're going to be doing, they're called volumetric studies. And basically what this does is it looks at a portion of the brain and we do an MRI and then we do an MRI a year later and we look to see if there are any changes just in the overall size of the brain near the area of impact. Because we do know even in some of the mild, mild traumatic brain injuries, we can see some changes. And so we're going to be um, working with that imaging. And as I said, we have it already available here in town and in the valley. And we're also going to be looking to see if we can spread it further out um, throughout the state so that we can have a imaging imaging set up that is standardized across the state in the, at least the major centers um, for everyone that has a head injury so that everyone can get the same level of care. Laboratory studies, um, I'm trying to get the word out again um, so that there can be some consistent just screening studies for checking things like thyroid um, for women, checking um, the different hormones that surround the menstrual cycle. Um, even if you're postmenopausal, it's important to check these because you can have some changes after a head injury. Um, for men, um, we're also checking testosterone levels and to make sure that these are getting done on a regular basis as well. And sleep studies, as I mentioned before, because sleep is a major issue and we can have central sleep apnea after head injuries. EEGs, um, it's we're also um, working on just getting some information out. Um, most people are familiar with what seizures look like if they're generalized seizures, um, but sometimes people are not as aware of some of the more um, subtle seizures uh, that don't necessarily involve whole body movements and can look slightly different. So we're trying to get information just to look to see what to look for so that we can get people in to get an EEG to see if they're actually having seizures and that they can be treated as well. So these are some of the things we're trying to do to get more uniform services, workup, care, and education out for the whole of the state. 
And then again, from a referral standpoint, we're working on getting more physical therapists and occupational therapists that have the specialty training for brain injury um, throughout the state so that people have that available to them as well as speech um, therapy, trying to get more people just up in the state itself. Having the appropriate people sent to the neuro -optom optometrists that we have, and then working on getting people into counseling, neurofeedback, and the medical specialties that they need based on what they're coming in with. And then, of course, trying to get education out there, both education on how to work on resting after a mild traumatic in, uh, brain injury, as well as education on things to do for a family member, loved one, or for a brain injury survivor themselves um, after a more moderate or severe brain injury, um, as well as looking at prevention, making sure that people are aware of helmet use, um, being careful on the ice, and so forth. So working on the education and the prevention are some of our um, key objectives um, for getting out to Alaska. And then working as a team for all of the providers that are involved in your care. And making sure that if it's something, you know, that's new, a new head injury, that you have close follow-up care, that people are working with you so that you can return to play, return to school, return to work, and get rid of the symptoms that are keeping you down. Typically, it's headache, sleep, fatigue, and mood. And once we can get those things covered and treated, that's typically when people can get back to work and back to life. And so we're getting the standardized assessments out there so um, and putting the information out there for everyone so that they can be used and people can get into services and making sure that treatment and evaluations are individualized in some way, but also that we have a good baseline assessment both for MRIs, for medical evaluations, for therapy evaluations so that everyone has access to the same level of care. And then working as a, basically as a team within all of these different disciplines so that we can get you back to what you want to do. And that is the end of the lecture. I wanted to give some time for any questions that may have come up. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be specific to things that I may have talked about. If you have some questions on things that you may have heard or um, any other questions about brain injury, injury in general, I'd be happy to answer those. If you'd like to ask a question, if you have a microphone on your computer or you're on the phone, uh, you can raise your hand. It is the little yellow icon on the bottom of your little toolbar for the webinar. Um, and then I'll be able to unmute your line. Um, now, if you don't have a microphone, you still want to ask a question, you're more, than, um, you're more than welcome to type it in. And then I will read it out for you so that we can make sure that we get all of your answers taken care of. Um, if you have any questions, um, we'll give you a couple of moments to find your hand raise or to type in. In this interim, this is Susan Mele, and I have a, a question for Amy because today when we were doing the professional session, Amy, you mentioned the value of EMDR as a treatment and how that had to do with reprogramming. And I'm wondering if you might describe that and also explain what EMDR is in case you know people aren't familiar with that. And of course it's just one mode and as you said behavior cognitive is very useful. But I thought that might be helpful information for folks to hear this evening. Absolutely. So um, I work um, with two modalities with therapies quite often. One is neurofeedback and the other one is called EMDR. Um, EMDR works very well um, whenever I have someone coming in, especially if there's also any type of trauma or even if there is a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, it works very well as far as the reprogramming and we had 
kind of touched on this earlier. Um, it's very common with trauma responses, especially after um, also having a traumatic brain injury, to have inappropriate anxiety responses to just normal things coming up in your day. So it's almost like a fight or flight response to something that should not cause that type of response. And so part of what EMDR works on is kind of reprogramming and trying to break that cycle so that when you are approached by things that are normal within your environment, it's no longer that exaggerated response. And it can also work on some of the things that are attached to the trauma that can also be triggers and try to basically deprogram that. Neurofeedback I also like because again it's working on the same model. This is working a little bit more on a model of plasticity and working on improving the overall um, awareness and attentiveness um, that can be sustained um, by someone. And basically that works on actually, you know, you're, you're wearing a cap, you're monitoring either a movie or your brain waves um, on the screen, but it's basically so that you can be alert and aware in the maximal place where we can typically bring input in. And so you're working on the reprogramming again of the brain so that you can be um, more aware, alert, and able to take in information. And both of these work very well together um, with cognitive rehabilitation. And they tend to, um, it's, you know, the two plus two equals five phenomenon. Um, they work very well together and they tend to build on each other very well. So I use these two modalities quite a bit. Okay, we have our first question from Ian. Is there a general time frame that you would say most signs and symptoms would dissipate, or is there a point where the it's just not going to get better becomes true? So when it, in terms of brain injury, you'll hear a lot of different um, topics as far as timeline. Now, if we're talking about mild traumatic brain injury, we say, you know, most, most cases of mild traumatic brain injury resolve four to six weeks on their own. However, those that do not typically require some type of intervention to get things going. Now, after a brain injury, um, most of the healing occurs within the first year. That being the case, there's still improvement, improvements that we can make even beyond that first year. So there's never a point of where, you know, if you've gotten to this, you're done and there's no improvements you can make. Um, in fact, I have quite a few people that have come in that are two, three years post-injury and had never started treatment that we make some pretty remarkable results with. So I think it's um, more dependent on the level of injury um, as well as, you know, what things have been started, what things are still there. And again, as we talked about, if a lot of the issues are still coming from the neck and that's something that was never addressed well, you don't have a timeline on the neck. And so if all of your symptoms are coming because you're having issues with the neck and we get that treated, you can find relief three, five years post. Okay. We have a question from Patricia. It says, how does one best access standardized ass assessment? Example, S had a head injury at age 16 and several more thereafter. She is now in her 40s. Who, what, when, where, how does she get evaluated? And so, what, when was the most recent one? Can you remember? She didn't give a date. Okay. She S had a head injury at 16 and several thereafter. She is now in her 40s. Okay. And so, a lot of the times this will come up, um, and it can come up in two different ways. If, if it's somebody that has an acute head injury and they're coming in to get evaluated either at the emergency room or by their primary care, um, because they've just had a head injury. These things are actually picked up when we use the OSU TBI short form because not only is it talking about current head injuries, it's also saying in the past, did you ever. When you are talking to somebody who's just coming in for a general checkup and they haven't had any type of recent head injury, um, the ACE is actually really good. That's um, through the CDC's website because you can go and it can you can get some more specific information about each head injury. 
Now, a lot of the times in the primary care field, there's just not time to do that. But if you have somebody coming in that's complaining of a history of multiple head injuries and you have some concern either due to sleep issues, due to cognitive issues or mood issues that started after maybe the first, second, third head injury, then that would be the time to determine whether or not that, you know, it would be appropriate for follow-up with somebody who is more specific, you know, neurology or so forth. Okay, we've got a question from Jill. Uh, what are your thoughts on the use of, use of SPECT imaging as a diagnostic or evaluation tool? We're working on it. Um, we're working on actually, it's, it's still in the research phase, and that's actually one of the things that we're working on trying to get up to Alaska. Um, so that we can start adding to the research. Um, MR spectroscopy actually has a lot of promise and um, we were working with it quite a bit when I was getting when I was leaving DC. I know our main physicist at uh, the National Institute of Health really thought that that was the next big promising phase for the future. Um, and I know that uh, Dr. Alex Lynn, he's up at Harvard. I was just um, he works a lot with our neuroradiologist here in Alaska. And so that is something that we're working on, getting the protocol so that we can start the research for. I think it has a lot of promise for the future. There really aren't any um, good protocols for us to use it in just general clinical use now, um, but definitely it's something that I think is going to provide us a lot of benefit um, within the next few years. Okay, I have kind of a patient question here. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel asks, my dad has had several brain injuries, last one in May 2014. How can we help him with his impulse control problems which are causing real damage? Impulse control issues are a big issue, and that's you know one of the things that I brought up, especially if somebody doesn't understand the extent of what they can and cannot do. It can be a real safety problem, and so it's kind of a dual approach. Um, part of it is, you know, especially if the impulse, you know, they think something, and boom, they're right there doing the action. There are medicines that we can use, and I, I tell people, I'm like, this is kind of like the brakes. It gives you that five seconds that you need to reevaluate what you're doing before you jump in and do something that may not be, you know, that may be unsafe. And then the other part, again, is working with therapy on kind of getting, um, part of it is the medications giving the breaks, part of it is the therapy working on, you know, okay, so what would be the better option? So there are things that can still be done that could be very beneficial. We've got no more questions left on the board. If there are any others, um, we've got just a moment or two. Any final comments from our panel? I'll wait a moment and see if there are any other questions. If there aren't, just want to thank everyone who's taken their time to join us this evening to let you know that um, Amy Murphy has talked about being available. Do you want to give your email? Uh, talked about uh, being available at the clinic, you know, uh, for information. Yeah, uh, for, and so for the website and uh, the the Anchorage Providence Brain Injury Clinic is where Amy is the medical director, and either you. Know, you can um, get in touch or a provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For and also, I want to um, thank Pat who has facilitated this so well for us, and just say that the Rural Veterans Health Access Project is very pleased to have been able to bring you uh, Dr. Murphy's presentation. And I also wanted to make everyone aware again um, the Alaska Brain Injury Network. We're very much working toward making a better website. Yes, I realize the website is not user friendly and we are working on that. Um, but the Alaska Brain Injury Network, we are really going to work on trying to put all of the information up there so that it can be kind of a one-stop shop. And so 
the document that I was talking about that has all of the information on what to do after a mild traumatic brain injury will be up there. Um, we're going to try to keep a list of all providers in every area so that you can look per area and see what providers are available and um, we can continually build that resource list. So these are things that we're going to be working on. Please stay tuned. Please keep that website somewhere favorited um, in your browser because it's going to be building on itself as things move forward. Okay, uh, we have two final questions um, and this should cover our time. Uh, can you speak at all about the long-term impacts of multiple TBI? So multiple TBI is a um, big issue, especially in the sports world, and we do know that there's a cumulative effect. Um, with each head injury you get, there's more and more of an effect and more and more of a risk for there being long-term issues, permanent issues. That being said, there's no magic number. Um, there's no way for us to say, well, now you've had three concussions. If you have the fourth one, you're done. There's really no way of knowing. And so we're really, um, especially in, the, in um, people who are 12 years and younger, we're very, very conservative, especially when it comes from a sports standpoint, because we don't know and we're trying to make sure that they have healthy brains for the future. Now, when it comes to being an adult, obviously we're going to try to decrease the number as much as possible because, again, we don't know what the num magic number would be for that specific purpose for that, I'm sorry, that specific person, but we are at least trying to figure out if there are any way we can um, kind of try to know who is going to be more susceptible to long-term issues with fewer hits versus somebody else. But again, that information we do not have. So the basic recommendation is to, you know, prevent any future head injuries if you've had one, and we do know that multiple head injuries do build on each other. Okay, and our final question from Jill says, are you accepting any subjects for the study that you mentioned? <laughs> oh, and yes, we will be, and I know that there are a lot of people that are interested um, in being part of the research, and um, definitely when that opens up, we will make the information available. So I said keep, especially keep the Alaska Brain Injury Network site in your queue because that's where we're going to tr um, really try to work on centralizing and getting these announcements out. Um, once that opens up, we're going, to tr we're going to open it up. I have a lot of people that really want to be part of the research because even if it's not anything that can clinically benefit them, it's looking to clinically benefit people in the future and we are very grateful for people who are wanting to participate in that. Well, that is the end of our uh, webinar presentation tonight. Uh, remember, if you want a copy of today's presentation, it is in the handouts tab that you can download right now. If you did not get, it, get a chance to download it and you would still like a copy, uh, you can email me. My name is Pat San Martino. I'm at UAA underscore AHEC, A-H-E-C, at UAA.Alaska.edu. Um, now, at the end of this presentation, when you close your, uh, the presentation now, there will be a short survey. We just ask that you give us a little bit of feedback. There also will be an opportunity for you to tell us if there is more information that you would like um, about this particular subject or any other subject uh, related. Um, so we really thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we thank Dr. Murphy and Susan uh, Maywick for being here. And uh, the presentation is now over. The webinar is now ended, and you may disconnect. Thank you.